Hey guys, <laughs> welcome to the show. <laughs> wow, it's awesome to be here. So I've got Sebastian DeWitt back. You've been on before, so I'm glad we can chat again. For the first time, his partner, uh, Ben Sandowski. Thanks, hey, for, thanks uh, for joining me, guys. We are in the WWDC studio, which is really amazing. I mean, we're looking at it from the behind the scenes and as camera uh, appreciators, Apple's done a great job setting things up here. So anybody that's usually an audio-only listener, I recommend. This is a good one to check out the video just to, just to, I don't know, see us all in person together. It's great. I'm trying not to look at the camera mostly because I want to look at the camera. Yeah I'm, yeah, I'm used to looking into the webcam while yeah. I podcast, but uh, well, yeah, we'll, we'll not worry about it too much. But great to have you guys here in person. We all just experienced WWDC 2024. This was a very big one. I have some point form notes that we want to hit and uh we don't have we don't have that much it'll be a relatively short episode so we're gonna have to sort of rush through some of it but let's start with what you guys have been up to lately which i've been using i was shooting while we were at the event brand new app kino um up until now up until recently there was really like shooting video i did it all with the default apple camera app then we had black magic and now we have you guys and i absolutely love this that there are options for you know, with the iPhone 15, we got prof like professional video because of a few features that Apple opened up, and now we have a few options of how to shoot it. So, well, congrats on the launch, first of all. Um, based on what was announced today, did you see anything that excited you about what you're going to be able to do, how you can expand either Halide, your other app, or Kino based on uh, WWDC announcements? I'm so excited I can reply to 100,000 emails saying, yes, you can finally <laughs> yeah. launch Halide from your lock screen. Yes. So. Yeah. Wow. And well, so we could launch it before. I've showed that in videos, having it uh, you know, up in the menu bar, but now you can assign it to that camera area. Mm -hmm. And then there's something with the lock features as well. And this, well, specifically, uh, unlike before, we'd actually launch the app separately. It's running in the background. So it's just, I haven't played and in, in, uh, set it up yet, but it should be just as fast as the first party camera where you just can swipe launches there and it feels much more integrated than before so and it's also just going to be right literally in the same launch spot so right yeah. Yeah. yeah and if all things work right you can even use it when your phone is locked which is kind of a huge deal it is and i, I sometimes i don't notice that i have to unlock it because often it just works right i'm unlocking and it's fine but if you're ever in a moment where you do you're like oh wait a minute this is actually this is a pretty big advantage of the built-in camera app and now you guys are able to be on a more level playing field with and it. Just to touch on that, like they, the reason it took so long for them to do that is they have to approach the security angle. Like if you use the first party camera, it locks out your photo library. So if someone like grabs your phone at the bar, they can't just browse through. So they did a lot of work to make sure it's still private until you do a full unlock experience. So they did it right. Yeah. 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 It was worth the wait. So, and what else did I miss? I mean, those are the, those are the ones I saw. Have you guys experienced much of the developer, uh, new info yet is there are there any tidbits that i haven't spotted by just watching the main keynote oh man i feel like even we are just still digesting a little bit because it was such a absolute rapid fire wwc like the keynote the state of the union they were really really jam-packed um some people <laughs> were saying like oh it's like a yeah. little bit light on i don't know ipad os or something it's probably because they couldn't literally fit it into the two-hour window mm -hmm. you know they were just breezing through platforms um so we're still kind of digging through it but do you have anything that like sticks out for you um there's like uh, on the api level they're going to be doing more of the stabilization that's available in the first party camera so there's an, mm -hmm. an extended extended stabilization and mm -hmm. usually apple when they launch something new they try to wait a year and they work out the bugs internally and then roll it out so uh, i it's like day three now but i'm going to keep digging in but i should expect to see just more stuff that i've been waiting for for so long yeah that one's big for me that's a reason that i'll go to the default camera app sometimes now is yeah. to get the like the best possible stabilization so having it everywhere is that's pretty big yeah, I mean, it's actually kind of crazy how good Apple stabilization yeah. is. I think people don't quite understand no, how good No, of course. It is. I, mean, I have this conversation pretty often. People are like, do I need a gimbal? Like, should I buy a gimbal for my phone or should I buy the Osmo? And you can. I mean, they are a, they are a bit more stable, but without action mode, just default out of the box an iPhone is extremely stable. So that team is like on another level. Yeah. It's, mm -hmm. it's pretty wild. But a feature that is coming to everything is well. There's a, there's actually a whole bunch of photo redesign stuff, but I've only I'm only becoming aware of various details. Uh, one that I think is going to affect a lot of casual users and creators alike is photo cleanup, which is drawing on the object detection that we saw with that like peel, you know press down and peel a subject out. Now it's filling in the background too. I don't know any any thoughts on it. 
um, like to your point, yeah, that it they did uh, object lift a few years ago, and usually they won't be first to launch something, but they'll take years along a process. Like years before the Vision Pro, they were adding APIs to detect hands. Mm-hmm. I'm like, huh, what are they doing with that? <laughs> and so there, I, I have confidence that when I actually play with it, it's going to be like industry leading what it's doing. Um, but no, I'm really looking forward to playing with it. Although, you know. That opens questions about what is a photo? (laughs) What is a photo, truly? Yeah. Yeah. I think, interestingly, if you can follow the breadcrumbs there, and there was like, I think it's the current shipping iOS version, iOS 17, or maybe even 16, where there's a little bit of infill happening on some lock screen effects where they cut out a person and the background gets a little, or maybe you zoom out um, and there's just a little bit of photo missing. They'll they'll just in-paint that right now. So it has been there all along. Mm. And now it's going to be interesting to see how that like stacks up to, you know, Adobe's Overall, I'm a fan of keeping it as minimal as possible. This is actually one place that I like. I want Apple to stay very conservative about it because talking to the general public, like people that aren't photographers, aren't in this world of creative production, there is a lot. They're, they're always like, I assume everything's fake. Like that, you know, if it doesn't look, if it doesn't look bad, they're, well, it's probably AI. Then it's probably generated by something. So I think the more ways that we can be aware, you know, spot that difference is helpful. I know Apple did say that they are flagging some level of meta- metadata to a cleaned up photo. So you somehow, I don't know where the flag will be, but you'll know yeah. in, a, in a way that something's been removed from it. So that's a positive for sure. I think that's really good. Um, I, I find it really interesting that all companies are introducing generative AI in some shape or another, um, but the messaging is wildly different. And I think mm-hmm. it, it's very dependent on the culture inside of every company um, with how much they are in touch with what creators or creative you know, people really want and what, we don't want is for it to replace our creative process. We want it to augment it. Right? Yeah. So like cleanup is a great example. Take away the work where I'm spending hours and hours in Photoshop, you know, recreating this particular pattern with the clone brush to get that one detail out of my photo. Great. Yeah. Um, give me a button that will uh, generate a photo instead of me like actually having the joyful process of framing and taking it. Not, not so great. Yeah, exactly. So, and I think Apple is so far, I think might have hit it the best, which is interesting because companies like Adobe are out there and are very much like tools for creatives, but they, they've they been like doing really good stuff and stuff that was like, press this button and we'll just make an illustration for you. And people are like, what? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I mean, to that point, there was also uh, wait, what's called Image Playground, right? which is their completely generative world where, you know, Apple didn't actually get into it that much. I We will talk about AI specifically later, but uh, I think in the YouTube video that I've posted so far, I was a little like, oh, I wish Apple had been even more conservative. They may have done more than I want. Now that I've seen Siri in person and seen some of these things happening, I'm like, maybe there were the appropriate amount of conservative because there are very few places that the system is generating anything for you. Um, you know, unless you bring into Chat GPT into it, which uh, I also heard Craig mention is off by default. So like that 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 plugin is not Chat GPT is not part of Apple intelligence. And I think that division has not been clear to the public yet, but it's it's good to get the word out there. Like they are different. Apple has its own models internally. That's what's running on device. And then everything else is outside of it. So uh, also those generative models, those are Apple. Do you guys see a place for image playgrounds? Like, are, are you going to use it? <laughs> Wait, uh, as a child of the 90s, we used to have these things called CDs, and there would be clip art. And if you were just doing yes. like a school newsletter and you just wanted a kid like throwing a baseball, that you'd use that. And it's nice that you can now generate images that are fun and creative. But oh, um, I'm so happy there's no photo real mode because also as a child of the 90s, CG back then, it just gives me the same nightmares when I see now like these photo real things and there's this like something a little off in the lighting or the faces and it's just not very good. But then there's also like the ethical side of it. And yeah. 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 I, I don't see something we would directly throw in there because we're so focused on the capture side of things. Yeah. Um, and I think that's one of those places where you want to empower people to just take images themselves and really feel like they're in control of stuff. Um, I think it's it, there's a lot of potential in like how you let people learn how to become better photographers. So that's not directly plugging into image playgrounds, but um, I think AI is a really good. Yeah. Thing. Yeah. It, all, all the times that that those generations are casual and fun and you know the gen moji like hmm. I, I think a, a lot of people won't take it very it's not very it shouldn't be taken too seriously people won't take it very seriously but that's good because it's like we're using it for an appropriate use right nobody's going to think that a gen mo- moji is real um but it does expand the ways that you can communicate with people and like it's sort of the the right way to use a 
diffusion model. Yeah. Right. I think it's pretty. I think you said it really well, honestly, this, this, that you, the kind of generative features they put in there, you just don't take too seriously. It's just kind of like fun and not, yeah, you know, disinformation generated. I was going to say like, yeah, the fact that you can't ask GPT to, you know, write this report for me. And then as much as they put warnings in there, mm -hmm. <laughs> you're going to see people like uh, use it in court. Like, yeah. you know, it's yeah. going to be really bad. <laughs> yeah. Well, and so, you know, rewatching the keynote as well, noticing that like the, anything that's like written, like when they, it, it, it's, mm -hmm. Apple won't write, do your homework for you. Yep. I mean, other than the math in the new, <laughs> in the new calculator app, which is pretty cool, but it's not going to write an essay for you. It's not going to like generate the text. It's going to, you know, you have to have already written something mm -hmm. and it'll refine it. Um, and even with the photos, photo cleanup, you know, it's, it'll only work with photos you actually took. It's not going to create a photo for you. Um, yeah, so, I'm sorry. On yeah. that note, I think what's really interesting there, and it's something B corporations are very allergic to is is the the perception of making content that's you know a little too risque or something that's just outside of what they want to be associated with. Apple is actually surprisingly hands off in terms of their moderation with that kind of stuff because they don't generate stuff for you. What they mm -hmm. do is they augment it. So last night, you know, there was the talk show, and um, I, think, I, I can't pronounce his name. The the, the man in charge of Siri at Apple. I'll, I'll put it up, please. JG, yep. John, John Andrea, I think. Um, but he, he he had a question about, you know, what if you, I guess their test case for, for AI doing bad is write me instructions on how to hotwire a car. Very yes. clearly yep. black and white legal, doesn't do that. Um, but Apple doesn't have a feature that says, write this for me. If I were to write a short story about hotwiring a car, you know, ChatGPT is like, uh, this looks pretty illegal, but Apple <laughs> yeah. will let you rewrite that in a different tone because they, no, but it's if true. You, so you can write about how to hotwire a car and then and Apple then will make it pro professional. More legible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Make it friendlier. Yeah, yeah. But this is my uh, handwriting. Yeah. And I think that's actually like, this sounds silly, but like as a creative, like that's one of the things I am maybe the most concerned about with AI is that we get into this Puritan society where we now have this weird corporate enforced set of guardrails where mm -hmm. like, this is admissible content and this is not. And then we just kind of have this weird online yeah. Disneyland because all the tools we use you know, will now determine what we get to make or not. Mm -hmm. And um, generative AI, I think, should rightfully have guardrails. But if AI is truly a tool for helping you with creative stuff, it should kind of get out of the way and let you do what you're doing, even if it might be about hardwiring cars. I mean, is there a reason that our cars aren't limited to only go 60 miles an hour? Like, right. sometimes you got to do stuff. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think the European Union has thoughts about that. Though, so. <laughs> With a cookie banner in the dashboard? Yeah, okay. <laughs> no, it's real. Like, yeah. They're actually, yeah. Anyway. I mean, I, yeah, I think overall they did strike a balance that made, that made a lot of sense to me and felt better than I was worried about. And I mean, I, the, some of the, the videos I posted of like just from the event, I just kind of shared some of the moments uh, showing off what Siri can do, what AI can do. And the there were so many responses that are like, you know, oh, it looks like OpenAI has got all your data now, like all your mm -hmm. data is gone. And so, you know, as somebody communicating this stuff, I'm just like, I should put it out there that I think Apple has done a pretty great job of closing a lot of this stuff off in the right ways. And even that, that OpenAI relationship is really at an arm's reach. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of rumors about it that I think made people think that OpenAI would be powering like Apple's so far behind in AI yeah, yeah. that we we need to bring in the experts from a third party and ChatGPT will be the AI inside the iPhone. And it is so not that, which I, I kind of hope that message gets out there because there's, I feel like there's a little confusion. In the Someone I think public space, didn't but, take the memo, some yeah, public figure. I think. Yeah. Well, and a lot of people just don't pay that much attention, right? Like yeah. they don't watch the whole keynote. They sure. just see a snippet. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's also because like Apple, it typically doesn't say this new feature is ML. They've been using ML for years, but to the user, they don't care if it's ML or what it's built with. So they have an amazing team here that publishes research papers and they just, <laughs> this is one of those, they were very humble about what they've been pushing as far as boundaries here. Yeah, that actually I would like to touch on for a second because I've, I've had a feeling about this that forever Apple doesn't advertise this well enough. Um, but they have this sort of, for some things they do, they have this zero trust, trust approach that absolutely blows my mind. So if you look actually at how Apple intelligence works, and I know some people listening or watching this are going to be like, ah, it's just marketing speak, you know, mm -hmm. so of course yeah. it's AI, but now it's Apple intelligence, it's totally different. But they, they made, they published a white paper and they are going so end to end with it where they're basically saying the data that's getting sent there is that, you know, it leaves your device, goes to a server that runs one particular chip, 
that request is made anonymous and non-trackable. You cannot see what, where it routes to. That server runs software that's checked by public independent researchers and will only run and communicate with your iPhone if it is running a version of the software that has been independently verified and cryptographically signed. The servers themselves, point to point, and like when they get transported and everything, all every step along the way it gets like verified. It basically and, and the data that's like at both being transmitted and at rest in those servers is not legible to Apple even. Like right. even if yeah. they wanted to, they could not access it. And it reminds me a bit of um, like in general, I, I think facial recognition is like a really you know troublesome trend. Like we don't want that to sure. all over our cities and that kind of stuff. And some people said like yeah, Apple is kind of normalizing this with Face ID. And then if you look at the way Face ID works versus like normal facial recognition, it's just, here's a photo of Tyler. Does it right. look like Tyler or not? Tyler or not, that's the technology basically. <laughs> Maybe a little bit. I, I need that app. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, but Face ID, like just to go on like a, a short tangent, but like this will blow your mind. Face ID takes a dot pattern of infrared dots that's projected on your face and turns that sort of 3D geometry into a hash. So it's like a one-time function, you know, mm -hmm. that, that sort of data that comes out of that is you can't reconstruct a hash out of like the 3D model out of that and puts it in a secure enclave, which the system itself cannot access. It can basically send a face to it and see like, does it match it? And then the chip is like, I'll check. Yes. Okay. And you can unlock the phone. Right. But, it, it, you know, so far so good. But you can say like, okay, what if Apple like actually secretly made yeah, it? What if that's not what's reversible? happening? Yeah. And what if the secure enclave is not so secure? And what if you can get in there? Well, they thought of that and they assumed in this entire chain that even Apple could not be trusted. So the data is unique per iPhone because at manufacturing, that dot proje like projector, that pattern is randomized. So even oh. if, if you manage to reconstruct it right. somehow... Yeah. That's and if you get it out of there, yeah, that's really that cool. data is actually not reusable. And it's the same kind of like defense in depth approach that took to this AI thing where like if one part of the chain doesn't work, right. it's still secure, it's still private. And it's crazy how good they are at this and, stuff. And to that point, one of the trade-offs is every time you buy a new phone, you have to retrain Face ID or uh, Touch ID. And also going back to what they're talking about the security around these servers, they mentioned that developers can't connect to them, which as a developer, like, oh man, this is a nightmare. But it's it's worth it because unless you design a system from the beginning as like totally secure, you never get around to it later. Mm -hmm. So it's like, it's a, it, it'll take a little longer to build something, but you're doing it right. Well, and similarly, I think a lot of people don't know that, you know, tapping with Apple Pay is much more secure than tapping with your physical credit card. I think the public assumption is the opposite. Right. It just because people don't spend much time thinking about it. But so for all those reasons, everything you just described about what they're doing with AI, like Apple needs to get out in front of that because we, what we've just seen with Adobe's terms of service thing lately. Right. I think so. I, po I, I posted my take on this on uh, threads, but... I, I think that whole thing is overblown. And this isn't to like stand up for Adobe, but making assumptions that like, I, you know, big, big corporations, you should always like have kind of a zero trust assumption. You know, you don't need to trust them with anything, but it's probably not likely that they're trying to sneak all of our personal photos out from under this under us to train their models with it. And, um, you know, it, but you can just see the default response, even from creative professionals. People that understand this world are very suspicious about it. Right. So right. everything you just described, I mean, the more that Apple can be extremely clear about every step in that process, the better f for them and for the more comfort we can have as users. So. Yeah. And, uh, you know, another, like, example, if we're talking about big corporations anyway, like Microsoft had this whole Copilot Plus mm -hmm. PC event, and there's a lot of really cool stuff in there, like, even for me as a Mac user. But then they announced this recall thing. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it's kind of funny. So recall, if you, if you don't know, best, best name ever. <laughs> okay, yeah, go on. It was very apt <laughs> in retrospect. What yeah. were they thinking? Anyway, so so it, it basically takes what they call snapshots. They're screenshots. It takes a bunch of screenshots of your screen all the time, and you know runs OCR and like AI on that, so it knows what's going on and puts it all in a database. Um, and they were, I, I went back because I thought I had heard them say, "This is encrypted on your disk and like safe." But what it is, what they said is, "This stays on device." <laughs> And I was like, okay, sounds okay. pretty good. So yeah. I mean, Start. Apple Apple always goes like through ridiculous lengths to explain security, right? Like this, you know, how they explained how, how our Apple intelligence works securely. Uh, they went quite in depth there, not quite as in depth as they could have, in my opinion. But every single time they introduce something that involves some degree of 
you know, private information that you like. And of course, it's privately secured on your secure enclave, yada, yada, yada. Uh, looking back, Microsoft didn't quite say this. And it, as it turns out, security researchers found that it is secured with your own credentials. But um, you can basically just, if you have access to the Windows PC, you can just get literally every, <laughs> there. you've ever seen and done yeah, on your right. PC out. Um, and it just shows like your iPhone, your PC is one thing. Your iPhone really is the most personal device, right? Like yeah. everything on there is your entire life. Mm -hmm. um, and if if they get that wrong, I mean, if, yeah, it's it's really, really bad. Yeah. So, I mean, good to hear. As developers, you feel like they are generally doing it right. Because it's really important to have that sort of third-party verification that it's like, it's we're not just taking Apple's word for it, that yeah. other people are keeping an eye on what they're seeing on these white papers on anything that is open source. Well, even yeah. even to that effect, like through the intense thing. So so as a developer, you, you'd assume Apple's whole Apple intelligence thing like just ties into all the apps on your phone like by default. No, you actually have to build using the same uh, APIs that, you know, make your data come up in Spotlight, make your data work with like Siri and that kind of stuff. And if you don't, that data doesn't get included. It doesn't get like auto scanned or into integrated or anything like that. Like Right. Yeah, it's built on the same stuff like when you use uh, Handoff. Or uh, years ago with Siri, like Lord suggests things to you and search, and so they've been building the infrastructure for this for like five years, but it's a hundred percent opt in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's pretty cool. I want to imagine into the future a little bit. So there's one one thing that I, I was only realizing kind of as the keynote closed, and based on some comments afterwards, that the OpenAI integration is basically a it's almost like a model plugin. It's like take your model and put it into iOS and macOS and you know, there will just be extensions to reach out to various models in the future. So it's not so as open AI focused as I thought. So this gets me thinking about like, well, that also means creatives will be able to have those models as well. Um, so I don't know, I'm just spitballing here, but let's say there's a mid journey model that is now integrated at an OS level. Um, you know, his examples were more professional. Like Craig mentioned like, oh, medical or, you know, like big industries. Yeah. I'm like, I don't know, like, I'm just kind of like realizing that yeah. there, there's all these other openings that are going to be able to integrate it throughout the system that can work in whatever industry you're in. Yeah, and I'd love if there were an option like, uh, obviously, you know, they're just giving an image of where things could go, but going to, new, to a 100% local model that's smaller, not going to be as accurate as something mm -hmm. talking to the cloud. But if you're feeling like I'm dealing with really sensitive stuff and I want 100% control, or you could train something yourself, like look at, you know, my writing back to college, or maybe not that far. That's okay. <laughs> but like, I would love something that's a little more natural when I'm composing emails. And what if I do a bespoke on-device thing, which again, you know, up until this point, everything was about on-device uh, local training and personalization. And so, uh, yeah, I just love that there's a thought of what, what is this going to look like in five years? Yeah. And well, I've already seen uh, colorist tools doing training on like film coloring and trying to turn those into models to apply colors to your footage. Um, so, you know, it can also be like looking at your the, the co colors of your photo library and how you generally work. And well, on that point, like there's a lot of talk in Hollywood about like where's AI fit in, where do the artists fit in, but like one area in AI that's amazing for professionals is uh, mat removal and mm. rotoscoping, yes. which is just such a, yeah. like 12 hours just staring at a screen, drawing an outline. And that's now, from my understanding, been obviated by these models that m allow you to focus on the actual creative stuff. No, totally. I mean, I would love to see this come into Final Cut Pro. Right now I'm using third-party plugins. Like, so Motion VFX has Roto AI and you just paint over the person. And uh, with a moving camera, everything's moving, nothing's planned, there's no green screen and it works. And there's, I mean, there's obviously a lot of concern about like AI taking away jobs in these industries, but so far my experience is like, I can just do more, you know, I'm a small creator with a small team and we can now elevate the work that we're doing using a whole bunch of new AI tools that we're not creating anything fake. We're not, you know, like generating stuff from scratch. And I don't think that's really going to take over anytime soon, but we are able to do a lot more than we were six months ago. <laughs> yeah, that's that's a that's a really, really good example of it. I, I think, you know, to to bring it back to the beginning of our of our podcast, like stabilization, like why does it work so well? Well, very clearly there's something going on there right. where it's aware of what you're filming. Yes. And uh, yeah, you could try to do this in post. You can, you know, track objects, all that kind of stuff. Like, sure. But if that happens on the fly, like wouldn't you want it to just do it for you? Because that's 
great. Well, what's really interesting, again, going back to ML with a stabilization, they can actually generate a heat map of like when you're looking at an image, where's your eye most likely to be drawn? They actually trained like a camera on people's eyes. And uh, so they can actually, when they're stabilizing, oh, you probably want to pan over to that corner Crazy. to that brutal. That's cool. Yeah, it's really, but they make it look so simple. Yeah. And it's when, like magic. When I did my action mode demo, I was like following a statue, right? And I, it was not in the center of the frame. It's like wobbling all over the place. When I review back, it's it's always bringing it back to center. There is clearly some awareness of, oh, we think you were trying to film this. And that blows blows my mind. Yeah, that's it. That's wild. And is so useful. And it's things that I don't, like, I don't think it can be as good doing it all in post because of understanding the motion data, which is not the, like the gyroscopes are not passed through to the final file and, and all that. So when the phone is doing it in real time so far, it's always better. Yeah. Yeah. I do want to return on like the, the strategy move of Apple, you know, and, and the, the, the chat GPT thing. Cause I think it's just fascinating. Mm-hmm. They were basically like, well, you can plug in any model you want. Yeah. And everybody thought, you know, uh, Apple is all far behind in AI and, and they're, they're going to have to come begging to Sam Altman to like, yeah, right. please give us some working AI. And they actually, they completely leapfrogged everyone's expectations and were like, actually we've got the most important AI for us is going to be the stuff that works on your personal stuff. And we took our time to get that right. And we're doing it really, really right and really, really private. And it's even going to just work on your device. So it's going to be much faster than anything in the cloud can be. It also unfortunately means it's only going to be on like one iPhone they released last year. Right. And yeah. not like all the Macs. I'm, I'm, right. not, I'm not that surprised. But. I'm not surprised. Yeah. Yeah. But there's definitely, you know, a lot of people are going to be like, oh, they're just trying to sell more phones. And it's like, you know, this takes like... Yeah, it's not easy. This is this didn't even exist a year ago. Like yeah, exactly. when the iPhone 14 came out, this was not even... It reminds me a little bit of like, sometimes people like take stuff that is like actually really computationally intensive for granted. Like, yes. Halide, you know, takes still photos so we don't get like a lot of requests of people being like, this is blowing up my phone. But I've had a few support requests from people saying like, I'm taking, I'm in the sun here in Death Valley and I'm taking 4K 60 FPS ProRes log mm-hmm. and my iPhone is like overheating and right. not working. I'm like... Yeah, yeah, it it, it, it would be. Do that. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, but anyway, to, to get back to the, the the thing is like, it's so it's so it makes so much sense and it's so clever. And I'm just kind of like amazed at Apple's deal making here, because I mean, surely like they if they don't like the terms with ChatGPT with OpenAI, they can just say like, well, let's go to like yeah, right. OpenAI. It is much more open than I thought. And there was this conversation of who's paying who. I actually don't think it's clear anymore because <laughs> it's much. It, it's not it's not a like apple leaning on open ai at all so. not at all and i actually i, I wouldn't be surprised if if um open ai is not being paid for this at all yeah. because you can actually so also a cool thing is you can sign in with your account mm-hmm. they, they made it really private even if you use chat gpt like it's not going to be tracked to you the requests are randomized all that kind of stuff unless you sign in in like in settings that's good else. to know actually so if you don't sign in it's, it's free randomized and randomized. Yeah. yeah. And so and they, they made sure it's not like trackable to single sessions and that kind of stuff. They try to make it as private as possible. Yep. S- sorry, Elon. Um, but then if you log in, you know, with your account, you get apparently you get extra features. Um, and the fact, well, let's say like, that they're kind of giving this away, what I assume is kind of being given away by OpenAI, probably also means that they got some really cool stuff in the works that they feel like right. this is something they can just like, yep. yeah, sure, whatever. Mm-hmm. Uh, speaking of big files and processing. Well, I got my first experience in the Apple Vision Pro oh. just uh, yesterday. So what do you think? I I mean, it's good. It's it's exactly as good as everyone said. We're a little, you know, receiving it in Canada. It's going to be released in Canada uh, in the next month or so. And we're a little behind because you guys have been able to use it for a while now. But um, yeah, so I guess I don't know what I can <laughs> Everybody else has said hardware is insane. The experience of being in there is incredibly convincing. Um, and I think we just need to like find the applications and the, the media for it now. And so speaking of that, a big, a big announcement as creators was seeing the cameras and lenses that could be used. Oh man. Yeah. Uh, the huge ones from black magic, but first let's just hit the Canon lens that was announced. It's an APS-C lens. Uh, it's got two small, I think seven millimeter lenses that shoot in spatial video and important to clarify the difference between spatial and immersive. Um, uh, if anybody has an experience or f- for everybody that hasn't experienced Division pro yet, um, spatial is basically a, th- a 3d image, um, done in, done in Apple's own way where it, you know, it feels like it's a hologram in front of you and you can perceive the depth. And then immersive is a 180 degree video that wraps around you. Um, and it's much more effort and time and money intensive. Um, but yeah, on your APS-C Canon, they use the R7 as an example. You can just shoot professional quality spatial videos, which is pretty cool. And it's pretty rad. Yeah. 
yeah, your iPhone does it now, right? And it has to kind of do it with two lenses, like your ultra wide and your yeah. main lens. I'm not sure if you did you see any of the iPhone spatial videos? I did, yeah, there? yeah. What and well, yeah, they're they're good. Be, I mean, they're good in the way that an iPhone video, well, a pro, heavily processed 1080. You know, like it's it's obviously pushing the iPhone to the max, and so it's a little grainier and it's, but it looks really nice. It, yeah. You know, for family memories and stuff, it's great. What I like with the rollout of this is actually that they're nailing the production pipeline because if you've messed around with like HDR, I'm sorry, but there's like 10 billion formats. Yeah, it's still not there. And it's nice that they've, they know it reminds you like the first iPod where they're like, okay, you can record H.264 video. You have no choices. And it's nice that they're just like forcing everyone and they have that uh, compressor support so you can edit another app and then export and it just works. Right. Because like all, you can have the most amazing hardware, but then it's the same problem with like HDR photos, which they're trying to solve on the web or uh, or uh, the different video codecs there. And they're like, nope, we're just, you have one choice. You can, you can get any car as long as it's black. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yeah, yeah. And the on the bigger side, they have the Blackmagic camera that does immersive. So recently at NAB, the Blackmagic had announced this 17K large sensor camera, and everybody's like, "This is insane and amazing. Why does this exist? Like, who is buying this? Who needs to shoot 17K?" And it turns Family out, if, videos. Yeah. if you want 8K per eye, you need you need uh, a big sensor, mm-hmm. and and so that's what I assume it's that exact or not exact, but basically that rig, that sensor with a fixed. Uh, not stereo, obviously. I got to learn some new language to understand how these things are shot, but a two lens system that are incredibly wide and uh, will somehow stitch together a immersive video for you. And so those are the ones that were really compelling for me in the Vision Pro uh, because now you are in the environment that, you know, if a person walks towards you, it feels like it, it's really there. And it feels like right now we're kind of like in that talkies phase where we have this new medium yeah. where people, what well, the first movies are like, there's a train moving. Yeah, and it's coming at me. Yeah. And like, we don't have the creatives who have figured out what's the language you're going to use here. And it's more like yeah. a play where when you're, you're watching a stage production, your eye can go anywhere. Mm-hmm. And like when people start figuring this out and innovating, you could watch the same piece of uh, uh, immersive content three times and get a different experience depending on where you're focusing your attention. Yeah. But like, we're just in the early days of that. Yeah, I'm I'm excited for the immersive influencer phase where you know, our, well, or the, like when we shoot travel videos and post them to TikTok instead of TikTok, like let's post them in like full, you know full immersive video. And there's you know obviously there's no platforms for that. There's like we're just getting there, but Blackmagic announcing this camera that was prop you know it's going to be affordable in a professional sense. Like Blackmagic generally keeps prices as low as lower than other competitors, um, means that there will be a lot more people that are able to shoot this. You edit in Resolve, and then you export in Compressor, which is interesting. Right. Yeah. yeah. So Apple's kind of still managing the pipeline, even though they're handing some of it off to Blackmagic. But I don't know. Are you guys going to pick one up? Are you going to ask you. Or are you going to pick up the Canon lens at least? All right. I have like three Blackmagic cameras. I don't even know why anymore. I just love the company. <laughs> just put them side by side and you can Actually, shoot that's right. Out. Although one of them will be a little too small. So maybe it's, uh, yeah. you know. It's like but, the iPhone kind of. Yeah, but no, the, it, I'd say like a company like Blackmagic makes perfect sense as far as with Apple where Blackmagic is like the anti-big company where they're just mm-hmm. doing cool stuff. Yeah. And I super respect what, they've, uh, what they're have what playing with. So yeah, eventually, uh, can we expense that? <laughs> yes, so, I mean, I'll tell. All right, all right. We heard from Tom. Yeah, yeah, yeah cool. I'll talk okay, to you. Well, expect that in the future. Yeah. Right, right, right. Our new like app reveals are all going to be completely immersive. You have to yeah. be in a yeah. pro. Yeah. But but yeah, there's still some missing pieces. So we're hearing some. Uh, you know, what is the file format? What are we? What are we? What are we creating here? I know the memory is going to be incredibly expensive. Like, or it'll take in a incredible amount of memory to shoot. Right. And I mean, to that effect, like okay, but. The, the, the immersive influencer, I mean, if, if so you're clearly getting one like that, that was obvious from your comments. I, I'm, I know, I'm just trying to get my way in there. I'm putting my foot in the door. I, <laughs> so nothing's like, promised here, but. We like, we, we, you need like a new platform for this? I mean, like you can go to YouTube, right? For immersive video. Like, Ex- no, exactly. Yeah. So. so they announced that Vimeo will be supporting spatial video. So, you know, there, there's more to talk about with spatial video actually, because it's more accessible. More people will be able to shoot for it. That's where the first influencers actually will show up. It's just so much more doable. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, immersive will be more professionalized. You'll have to be, have a bigger budget and have a bigger workflow for that. It's not going to be as casual 
for a long time. We'll be showing that on your iPhone. It's just more, it's just more, it's amazing. It's yeah, crazy. Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah. Well, to, to that effect, I actually want to remark on spatial video. Another API thing, there is an API for spatial video now. Oh, okay. So we were Sorry. actually, you know, one of the great things about WWC for us is, you know, yes, we go to Apple Park. Yes, we get free snacks and we get to watch the zany tricks that Craig Viteria gets up to this year on live, on a live keynote. Um, but we get to sit down with some of the actual engineers at Apple that make these technologies. And um, there was a funny sort of reversal where um, I'm standing there um, chatting and two of them come up to me and they say, hey, I know usually this is where you ask us questions, uh, but we work on a spatial video team and you know we would love to see what you think of what we announced this year on you know spatial video because we'd love for there to be apps that take spatial video. So um, it's really cool to see that that's also, you know, there's, there's that segment, there's the Canon. I think the Canon lens only works on the R7 or R9. They said that in the keynote and I, but then seeing news afterwards, I think it's just a lens, an APS-C lens. Okay. So it's like you just Slap need on. high resolution APS-C sensor. They I bet it would work on R5. Experience. Yeah. yeah, I'm, yeah. Not, I'm not sure yet. But. Anyway, then there's the black magic camera, which has a price of like, if you have to ask, dot, dot, dot. And mm -hmm. then, you know, spatial video, which you can take on your iPhone 15 Pro, yeah. which, um, that, that is really cool that they're pushing that forward so that becomes an accessible technology to a lot of creators. And I mean, like Mirson, like Steven Soderbergh's shot uh, some feature films on an iPhone. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the Florida Project was shot on an iPhone. So right. if you're a creative and you just want to dabble in the platform, it's going to be a great entry point. And uh, I also can't believe I'm bringing up Apple TV Plus and talking about tech, but like it's also going to be seeing on the other end of the spectrum that there are going to be there's going to be content coming out that actually shows tries deliberately to push it to the edge to be like, okay, yeah. this is how you do right. it, guys. Yeah, this is how you do it right. Mm -hmm. um, I think one th circling back kind of to our beginning of the conversation and your guys' new app Kino, I think we are about to hit the year, maybe next year, but where like everybody's footage out of camera looks as good as as a movie. I mean, so obviously Apple Log has been huge this year. Amazing. I can't, I can't talk. I, I feel like I haven't even talked about it enough. It really cha uh, it changed what the iPhone is as a video camera, you know. And I think casual users don't haven't realized it yet because the workflow is still complex. But apps like yours mean you can instantly bake in a look that is Hollywood grade, and the camera in the iPhone is excellent. Yeah, and these shots will, you know, so. People at home with an iPhone 15 will be shooting things that out of camera look movie quality, you know, like all, almost exactly there. And other cameras are doing it now. I was just reviewing the Panasonic GH7 that has the Alexa Log C built in. So you can just instantly color match it to a $100,000 camera. Yeah. And w even Pretty with the iPhone, you know, I could, you've got some LUTs built into the app already. But really I could build one by you, actually. Yeah, yeah, well, from yours truly, yeah. But I could also, I could build one that matches to Alexa without that much effort. And now your iPhone looks the same as that Panasonic that looks the same as Alexa, which is... Well, not to nerd out too much on the technical, but like also Apple Log does really cool stuff around uh, exposure fusion when it's capturing. So mm -hmm. the dynamic range could outperform a lot of the uh, cinema cameras in the past. Yeah. Like I was looking, I was grading footage in Resolve that was, uh, and I was just confusing it with my Blackmagic 6K Pro. Like, wait a minute, wait, this was shot on an iPhone? Like there's that just one moment where you can't believe what they're putting in that package. Yeah, yeah. I always want to say that definitely nerd out. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> okay. Full permission to nerd out. Oh, right. yeah. uh, on that note, the keynote was once again, just shot on iPhone. And yes. I think it was Stu Mashwitz who remarked on threads. That's like, we've just reached the point now very quickly where it's just, yeah, let's take it for granted. Yeah. We don't, we don't need to have a post keynote conversation about the shot on iPhone. Cause it's just happening. It's just happening. But it's, it's, it's amazing. It's like yeah. really amazing. Yeah, exactly. And it, it, actually interesting, the last in the iPad announcement that they did have a few segments where they, again, Stu was the one talking about this. They mounted some Panavision lenses to the iPhone. Totally. Because everybody's looking at this library section being like, why is the background blurry? You can't shoot log in cinematic mode. And there were some people like, I was leaning over to you like, <laughs> That bokeh can't be real. Yeah. Like, and you yeah. were saying, no, no, it's that real. Oh, that's right. Yeah. There were some parts in the State of the Union, which I might be wrong on this, but there were some parts where I was like, that was cinematic uh, mode or post blur. And that was ground glass adapter. Because I obviously you have to use like, you don't, you know, take the iPhone module off and put the lens on. Yes. The so yeah. do you, right. they, you have some, you know, trade offs with the ground glass adapter stuff. But it's really cool that they, they do do that because I feel like it would feel a little flat if they only shot with like, iPhone lenses. I, I like I spotted chromatic aberration in the lens, but right. that's because the iPhone is picking up the in, imperfections in the lens. Yeah. It's like, oh, okay, it's too real to be real. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah the lens, the iPhone becomes basically a sensor. Like the iPhone lens is just a window into the sensor, and it's mostly you're just using a sensor with a 
<laughs> big lens on it. <laughs> but it's, you know, when you watch those workflows, it's just not that dissimilar from what we've done before. Oh, and actually, so big changes, I, we don't know that much about it. You've seen some of the API stuff, but that, uh, you know, when they previewed uh, the new Final Cut Pro app coming to iPads, so this is from the last announcement, but I didn't get to talk about it on the podcast yet. Yeah. Uh, there's live streaming, there's wireless. The multicam. Yeah, multicam, the, the yeah. multicam. To me, even more exciting, there's just the live monitoring. Um, yeah. Are there API tools that let you guys work with that stuff as well? Is that going to be? Well, we, we never pre-announce uh, future product. But we don't talk about future product. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But has but Apple we, offered any tools that? Oh, I mean, like API wise, I was yeah, yeah, because we we do have like an iPad monitoring app. But yeah, uh, exactly. And I'm just like, I lo I love that now the iPad and iPhone are like starting to talk to each other more. Too like that this it it. Because, you know, right now, if I'm shooting myself, it means that I'm setting up a big camera, running cables out to it. And, you know, I, I can use my iPad now, which is great, but I still need to do all these adapters like the iPhone solutions. So when awesome. we, we were dog food in Kino, we would be shooting videos and doing uh, a YouTube video. I was like, how do I monitor I would AirPlay over to my Mac, which is like a stopgap. Yeah. And there's like they've been building this technology again for like a, a decade, starting with AirPlay on Apple TV. But then there's also you plug in an HDMI adapter. Um, I have like a workout uh, system where you plug it in a dock and it connects to a TV. So there's a tons of different ways you can do it, or you just do Wi-Fi bonjour. So it's definitely there, but it's, it's technology aside. How do you make it intuitive where it's mm -hmm. just like you, like with the new pay stuff, you just tap your phone and it's paired. Like right. yeah. that's the hard part for most people, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, I know I'm going to use it all the time. I, like this has been the year that, um, uh, maybe not coincidentally, but we've ended up with a bunch of like commercial clients where we're shooting way more social stuff on our iPhone. Like we're doing jobs that we would have needed the big camera for last year on the phone and it's in log and it can look just as good. So now we just kind of need to fill out that range of, of tools to totally. be able to like treat it like a full production where, you know, you're, you're monitoring, monitoring your audio and just like all the other pieces can connect in. And, you know, uh, hopefully this is also easy enough that like everybody can do it, but it also is becoming expansive enough that we can take on like full productions at this point, which was 100% not possible last year, like right. so recently. Yeah, it's it's crazy to see how much it's come like in one year if you look at Apple Log, but also look at Blackmagic Camera, look at Final Cut Camera that's apparently mm -hmm. coming out soon. Like that means that there are teams at Apple that are supporting now the very real use case of the camera app. And yeah. like when we got started, you know, camera apps were mostly the domain of like filters you slap on something. There were, you know, a couple, of course there were some apps that I mean, like also let you adjust settings, but I started using Instagram because it had good filters. Yeah, like, exactly. That's what all it was at first. And that was the only way to make your image look better. Yeah. And now if you, you know, there's lots of ways to get less or more processing for instance, Apple Log, Pro Raw, Native Raw, that kind of stuff mm. uh, to dial in your settings, right? And we'll, we'll see down the line, like increasingly, you know, the need for a camera, dedicated big camera is going to be less because your, if your iPhone can handle it with the right apps, with the right tools, then why wouldn't you use that? Yeah. Sebastian, what's your editing workflow right now? I mean, you shoot a lot of raw. I mean, you're a great photographer to start with. Thank so you. whatever you're using, you're using, it wouldn't matter. <laughs> but you do use an iPhone uh, shooting raw yep. often yep. and the photos look great in the end. What's your workflow? Um, for right now, basically I, I get home, I take my pro raw files and I plug in my iPhone and I pull them into my laptop. I get them in the Lightroom, slap one of my presets on it and then... Um, export them back to my iPhone. You make it sound so easy. Okay, wait, but I have a specific question with Lightroom. So when I plug my iPhone in, one problem is it wants to hit my whole library. It's like- Oh, I actually use an app that like let, called iAmazing that lets me grab the, like say, I so anyway, it yeah. th th lets you grab like the file system. So it opens like a USB drive. That's, just drag it yes. Out the okay, I think I do know what that app is. Yeah. That is a good yeah. tip. Yeah. Well, for anybody to listen to the end, that's, I'm glad they heard it. <laughs> my workflow is uh, if I take a photo for a product shot, I send it to Sebastian. <laughs> yeah, he's actually, my, he's, my, uh, he's my Sebastian intelligence. Can I subscribe to yeah. this uh, <laughs> service as well? Yeah. Yeah. Like like film labs in the old days. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Actually, that is a thing. You can just like send it into editors and, you know, get things done. You should make like a, a new product subscription. Basically, like have some <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> well, uh, guys, I really appreciate you coming on. This was awesome. There's so much more to talk about. Uh, I know we didn't even get to so much, but thanks for thanks for making a great app. Thanks for joining me at WWC. And yeah, can you guys also plug where anybody can find you online? What's the best place to discover your Lu work? Lux.camera is a usual where we announce stuff. But uh, if you look up uh, Shot with Kino, I think is uh, the best place to get an entry point for the stuff we're doing there right now. Yep. And Halide is uh, Halide.cam, C A M. Uh, I'm Sebastian, just at SDW on all the socials. And uh, yeah, check us out. Thank you.